There's a town in Western Australia and it's called York. It's a couple of hours out of Perth. Here's a tourist ad for you. Looks really pretty, right? But I ask you, what even is York? What is Perth? What is Western Australia for that matter? These are all colonial names for towns founded by settlers and invaders and frontiersmen variously atop indigenous land. Names imported from Europe here and there. So do they represent the land that they've been placed atop? Or is there some deeper sense of place or of sovereignty at play here that can be asserted? And these are all decent questions that have been asked a lot before. And obviously to help answer them, we can ask Indigenous people. You know, we could go to York, for example and speak to the Baladong people of the Noongar Nation all about that in that local context because they are the long-time custodians of the land that the town called York now sits on. And indeed, all over the continent, settlers like myself could stand side by side with local Indigenous comrades in a fight for recognition of Indigenous sovereignty, placehood and indeed ownership. Yeah, you could do that. Or, now bear with me, you could just take the York Courthouse and make a new country. What do you say? So here's a couple of blokes claiming the York Courthouse uh, in WA in 2020. They're claiming it as New Westralia, a would-be new micronation. Here's what their website says. New Australia attests to be the legitimate sovereign authority acting in the interests of the people native of the dependencies of Western Australia, their heirs and successors, and Defender of the Imperial Realm proper, in the name of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, the Protestant Supreme Governor of the Church of England, in her absentia by capture, retardation, disinterest, or uncaring of her loyal subjects' current plight, as it may be. So, these people are but one flavour of sovereign citizen and they've decided they're going to need to break into that courthouse to realise their vision for New Australia. Open the doors in the name of Queen. Open the doors in the name of law. Open the door in the name of universal law. Open these doors to freedom and the kingdom of heaven. So as you can see, sovereign citizens, or sovsits as we generally call them, can sometimes go hard. And they've always been around, well, for quite a long time anyway. But in the pandemic, they've been a lot more ubiquitous and a lot more enthusiastic. So we're going to hopefully answer a lot of questions about them in this two-part video. Where do sausages come from? What are their favourite brain worms? What are the core sausage beliefs? What do they do in practice? And later, in part two, we're going to have a look at the two sovereignties. And they're different in all but name. And I'm talking about indigenous sovereignty and Sovsit style sovereignty. Unfortunately, as we've seen recently in Canberra, lately that is not just an academic difference because the two camps have literally had to stare each other down. So there's a lot to cover here. But first, let's talk about nations within nations. God bless the man. Where are we? We're in New Westralia, guys. And they've knocked down the door of the York Courthouse to get in. 
And they were claiming it as a new nation, a new micro-nation within Australia. Now, this mini-insurrection slash micro-nation attempt didn't last very long, unfortunately. First, they told a passing cop about it, who seemed pretty bemused about the whole thing. How did you get in? We uh, took entry and possession. Oh, OK. Would you like to take these papers? Because we sent these papers to you sometime ago. This here is from the District Court recognising New West Australia Executive Council in uh, the dual capacity. So we have been recognised within... All right, well, I'll have to go away, as you can understand. And, <laughs> and oh, and Would you be able to turn that uh, off? I don't have the access code for it. I, I don't know. We're, it's not too loud. I've got dragged out of bed. Yeah, yeah, late right. nights, I've been dragged out of bed uh-huh. based down here and gone... Oh, I think it's probably a cleaner or something yeah. in there. And yeah, yeah. We're just going to have coffee and be hanging around for the... I'll be back, obviously, dressed in something other yeah, than this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad we can caught and catch up there. And then they went in and they did some pseudo-ritual shit with a Bible or fucking whatever. And then the cops came, the alarm ringing in the background, and they took them away. But the dream lives on at www friendsofnewwestralia.com Setting aside New Australia though, not all would-be micro-nations are anywhere near as antagonistic in their origins, at least not to you know, breaking and entering into local courthouses anyway, maybe antagonistic to the government. and Also not nearly as fringe. In fact, we've got a bit of a history in Australia of regarding some of them as kind of twee sort of folk heroes. Does anyone remember Hutt River Principality? Welcome back. Imagine never having to pay tax again. Well, that's exactly what one man and his family have managed to do for nearly 50 years after setting up their own principality. Australia has two monarchs, Queen Elizabeth and here's the other one in the cardigan. Your Royal Highness, good to see you again. My pleasure, sir. The province, 500 kilometres north of Perth, attracts thousands of tourists a year who make the trek to have their passports stamped. Nil, nil tax, 37, nil tax, 38, nil tax. And so it goes on, because... You're a non-resident of the Commonwealth of Australia. I have the no commander of the Royal Order of the Principality of Hatteva. Sure, not endorsed by the government exactly, but definitely appreciated enough to be given the folksy sweetheart a current affair treatment, and that is saying something. Now, Hutt River Principality ended tragically a few years back after Prince Leonard finally ceded and wound up being finally hit with a phenomenal tax bill. And in fact, he did die in 2019 at the ripe old age of 92. May he rest in peace, the Prince. And in fact, to honour him before we go on, why don't we sing the New Australia Anthem together? And it's actually performed by John English, this one. Righto. It's a hard land, but it's a land filled with love and death. Thank you. Hopefully you all stood and respectfully sung the national anthem with me, the micro-national anthem. Australia actually has one of the highest number of micro-nations of any nation in the world. Weird, hey? Here is but a couple. The Empire of Atlantium was founded in 1981 by Imperial Majesty George Cruikshank II, Emperor of First Among Equals. It's a property in New South Wales, to be honest. It has its own pyramid, a post office, government buildings, currency, and national anthem. And that sounds very nation-ish. And it has its own Airbnb. Nice one. The Erican Empire is, well, a 
bloke from Montreal founded a micronation in Australia, but he also founded one in Montreal and in other places, including a little parcel of land on Mars, apparently. Now, because there's a bunch of nations, what does that make it? An empire. It's a fun Googling sesh if you're into that kind of thing. Now, notably, some of them are indigenous in nature, and we're going to look at them in part two next time round. But for now, what underpins the isolationist ideology of the Sovsit style people and micronations, as the case may be? What exactly does the average Sovsit think? Let's do it with some assistance. And who better to assist us than Rob Sudi, the man on this subject? Rob runs the incredible blog site, Free Man Delusion. I have mentioned that blog in my videos numerous times. Rob put together what I think is the definitive encyclopedia and historical and current resource on Australian Sovset rhetoric, figures and so on. Rob's been having running battles with Sovset figures and influences for longer than most of us ever even knew what this idea was. Rob's actually an ex-Sovset himself. He told me all about it in a chat from out in his remote property where he lives mostly off the grid, hence the chickens. I only sort of got into that pseudo-legal movement for about two years before it, I sort of realised that it didn't didn't have any validity in law and took it through the courts and uh, and failed horribly in that. <laughs> but it was a learning curve <clears throat> where I realised that why why these things don't have basis in law to be able to be used. That started a journey of, of actually looking through each one of the fundamental doctrines that are, are spread by the movement, looking for the for the decisions of the higher courts of, of why they've been rejected and what they rely on to reject them. And Rob doesn't appreciate the term sovsit so much. I don't really like the idea of uh, the, the term sovereign citizen myself. It's sort of, I think it's a bit outdated. Um, it's more US centric rather than looking at the evolution of that whole mm. pseudo legal movement. So whether we call it Sovsit ideology or organised pseudo-legal commercial arguments, as Rob prefers, it's important to bear in mind that all of the following brain worms were thieved by Australian Sovsits from North America, US and Canada variously. They've just been given an often flimsy Aussie coat of paint. But where I can, I will tell the flimsy Aussie version, if it even exists, that is. Common law. So... There's this prevailing idea that we'll cover later in the history of Sovsitary that a certain US amendment that was introduced betrayed the original constitution. Well, the idea goes that when that happened, the US government ceased to be a people's government, so its law became invalid. Its law became a corporate law, a commercial law even, as they sometimes say, underpinned by a sham set of maritime laws. Long story, but I'm just trying to tell you that if you ever hear them talk about admiralty or maritime law or about how they are not a docked ship, it's just their funny little way of saying that the evil commercial government fake law doesn't apply to them. The real law, they say, the constitutionally faithful law, the only law these people would listen to, became the common law, the de jure or legally rightful government and law for the people. The common law was sitting dormant because the government had abandoned it, you see. So that's why all these kooks get to rush in and claim it, and thus power, for themselves. So common law means authentic constitutional law, or sometimes biblical law, or sometimes traditional ye old fashioned law dating back to the Magna Carta, or sometimes divine law, or sometimes law what just makes sense, you know, in like a folk wisdom -y way. Like, just think about it. Like, just the way like we used to live in the good old days. Sometimes just any law that a divorced, soft-sit, control-freak, family court loser happens to decide 
is the right one, even ones they invent. It's very vague, actually, as you can see. Sovsits say these laws supersede every other law. Most of it does actually come back to these biblical foundations. Wayne Glue has them same sort of um, beliefs as well um, with the Bible. He has his Bible beside his, you know, Quick and Garren um, annotated constitution as, as if them two books cover everything that there is to see in, in law. Yes, we're going to look at Wayne Bloody Glue at some point. Hold your horses with government as a corporation. So, you see, the original global bankers overthrew the world's governments, right, and put them all into debt. The government was thus transformed into a corporation. <gasps> a new series of commercial laws subsumed the rightful constitution and then took away all legal rights for Americans. Cook has called this corporate government the de facto government, an illegitimate one. Now, the Aussie rendition of this, well, it varies depending on which sovereignty you're listening to. There's one version that says that in the late 1970s, there's a record of an Australian government logo patent being registered in the US, which there probably is for the use of the logo or the trademark as used in the US. Sure. They reckon that means that's the date we became a corporation. There's another version going around at the moment that when the federal government moved away from old Parliament House into the new Parliament House in 1988, that's when the corrupt corporate government came in. More on that in part two. And then there's an actual product you can buy being peddled by famous Aussie sovsit cooker Wayne Glue. Wayne has been for years selling a hidden red version of the Constitution, the original version. It's a copy of the political party's edition of our Constitution called the Australian Constitution. And it's a revised edition of this. To remain under the Crown, we have to remain under this, the Commonwealth Constitution not their new version which they decide to print after we said no they printed a nice new green one called the australian constitution which is nothing but lies fraud and nonsense they call it legal legal is not lawful lawful means it applies to the law our law our constitution only $150 for a big red useless book. If anyone has one of them out there, please get in touch with me. A person, an individual, can't be a corporation. It's, it's only a group of individuals that can become a corporation. Um, so, and the only way for jurisdiction to exist is for that corporation to deal with other corporations, meaning, you know, the birth certificate name. Straw men. So when the government became a corporation in debt to the evil, j sorry, bankers, it was so deep in debt that it had to offer up you, its own citizen, as collateral. Fucking treason! And so, because you're basically now collateral for government debt, you're actually like a little registered company that's basically just you. So there's you on paper the debt collateral version of you, and that version of you is the one, would you believe it, to which all your debts and bills and fines and shit go in Australia. And that version of you is called your straw man. So there's debt you and then there's real living human you. And so as long as you reject the idea that you are your straw man and assert that you are your own sovereign organic living, breathing human being. Hey, presto, you don't ever have to pay any bills or vacuum your living room or do the dishes like me, you know, a sovereign, living, breathing human with very dirty carpets and no clean plates. Sovsits reckon that the capitalised way they put your name on bills and court notices and shit rather than just being the product of computerized databases is actually because it's not you they're even addressing it's your straw man that's how you can tell it's in all capitals and the thing is about this it all works bro it's all 100 percent true it all means you get out of paying anything you don't want ever you never have to vacuum or do the dishes again either trust me give it a go 
you'll be fine. Just kidding. I sent in paperwork uh, relinquishing my birth certificate and sending it back in to say I don't want nothing to do with that. I didn't give permission for that and, and, and I'm not a person anymore. I'm not a citizen. I'm, I'm just a human being. And by doing that, it, it, they imagine mm. that that removes all jurisdiction um, and uh, what the definition of a person um, that you notice in legislation that has that a person commits an offence, not a, a man or woman or or anything like that. So they try to do away with that legal personality in an attempt to avoid jurisdiction. What is the genesis of all these brain worms? Where did they come from? Let's look at Sovsit history. It's a hard land, but it's a... The term sovereign citizen loosely describes someone who says they're only subject to whatever laws they believe in uh, or whatever their interpretation of those laws are. I think there are two primary proto sovsit historical factors from the US. One is the tax protest movement. The other is the first Sovsit group, the Posse Comitatus. The Posse Comitatus was founded in the 1970s and they were a pack of raving white supremacist anti-Semites. They believed that the US government were an illegitimate corporation exploiting its citizens as collateral for its loans. We covered that a little earlier. But it bears mentioning that the original rendition of Sovsit fairy tales held, of course, that the global bankers in question were evil Jews. It always seems to come back to some sad white cunt feeling sorry for himself, fretting at night about the bad Jews and counting out his remaining reserves of semen like they're Pennies. The founder of Posse Comitatus was a guy called William Potter Gale. He was a racist army veteran who had a beef with the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution because it said that anyone born in the US was a citizen. Why didn't he like that? Because he said the original Constitution granted real citizenship only to whites. The US's Nationality Act of 1790 had restricted U.S. citizenship to only free white persons. But time moves on, doesn't it? Funny how that happens. White supremacists don't like that kind of thing, the whole time moving on thing. They like an unvarnished constitution. And of course, the world of the 1700s, that's their jam. Gale and his group, the Posse Comitatus, were the first constitutional essentialists. And so whether they like to admit it or not, the simple reason that all sovsits bang on about secret original constitutions to this day is because of posse comitatus being mad that brown-skinned people wouldn't get to live next door to them. The posse comitatus had this idea that county sheriffs were the only legal law enforcement officers in the country and that those sheriffs actually had an obligation to protect citizens from the federal government, even being able to hang federal officials and who did stuff like, I don't know, you know, try to charge tax or let brown people exist, those sorts of things. So, common law, obsessions with the Constitution, the idea that you can make your own sheriff badge, big global banking Jews, what forced your government to sell you off as debt, corporate personhood, corporate governments, all that kind of shit. That all comes from Posse Comitatus. The Posse Comitatus also gave the world one Gordon Carl, who started out in 1967 sending the IRS a letter saying he would no longer pay taxes to the Synagogue of Satan under the second plank of the Communist Manifesto. By the 70s, he'd kicked off the Texas chapter of the Posse Comitatus. And then in 1983, in two shootouts in North Dakota and Arkansas, he killed three federal officers and, in the end, was himself shot and killed. The other notable factor in the genesis of the soft sit movement worth mentioning in the US context is the 1950s tax protest movement. These guys ended up actually inspiring Posse Comitatus, so they came before them. And these are just people who would sue or take vexatious action to try and recover the income tax they paid. Sometimes they'd file blank returns. Sometimes they'd try and 
charge the government for tax, either by suing them or by sending them their own demand for tax. Actually, there were quite a lot of entertaining tax protests or efforts from that era, but they were all underpinned by the idea that paying federal income tax was illegal and unconstitutional. I also believe that. I also believe that all of my bills are illegal and unconstitutional. And also, having to vacuum my living room and wash the dishes is illegal and unconstitutional. Uh, you know, I am a sovereign being, um, and, and it is my sovereign right to just sit there amidst the filth and play Nintendo Switch instead. There's a guy called Arthur Porth, who was a real legend of the 1950s and 60s tax protest movement. Arthur once tried to avoid doing a tax return by pleading the Fifth Amendment, invoking his right to protection from self-incrimination. Once he'd made a bit of a name for himself with that, he started touring America, uh, peddling a manual called, inventively, a manual for those who think that they must pay an income tax, which is really the first sovsit kit Fighting back against government policies and mandates and bills and laws by being a vexatious citizen or litigant or generally a really difficult person, really important facet of sovereign citizenry, and it comes from these guys. Now, Rob Sudi of Free Man Delusion suggests that there's a third factor which directly influences Oz Sovsits, and that has a Canadian lineage. We, we actually take it a lot more from the Canadian Freeman on the land movement than we have directly from, you know, that ancestor strain of, of the sovereign citizen posse comitatus movement. Um, interestingly, like the, the English common law, um, the common law movements in the, in, in the UK right now, they were actually exported there from Canada. Um, all the things about the Magna Carta and these sorts of things. That didn't actually exist in the UK before it came from Canada, which is strange because the Magna Carta being a, an English you know, document, um, you would have thought that it would have started in the UK and spread to Canada, but it's actually the other way around. Everything that happens in Aussie soft world is a cockeyed, thieved version uh, of real North American soft fantasies and conspiracies. But that being said, let's chart the transition when Sovsit shit came to town. It's our own line, built with love. Free Man Delusion tells us that some of the earliest Sovsits include Malcolm McClure and his group Upmart, who were the first to import the common law ideology of the US and Canada into Australia. Malcolm made his coin selling these grifting toll exemption legal kits in the late 90s. Later in the 2000s, he would sell common law vehicle registration kits. And then he would sell common law marriage kits. Kits, you see. Lots of selling of kits, kits, kits. This is a favourite activity among the sovereign citizens. Selling you shit that purports to help you magically become sovereign. Hi. I'm Malcolm McClure. Have you ever received a speeding or parking fine that you thought was unjust? It's time for us to wake up. Winners at Law gives to you the legal tools, DVDs, courses and books to empower you, the individual, to command your authority at law. Malcolm McClure once somehow got in the ear of tyre tycoon Bob Jane, but Malcolm is so bad at law that he actually prevented Bob from being able to use his own name to sell tyres for a while, which is quite an achievement. A judge called Malcolm an incompetent, ignorant charlatan. Another early adopter was Peter Nolan, who's a real scumbag, MRA parasite, and he would offer up these soft-sit, get-out-of-jail style tricks, but he was doing it to help, say, rapists get out of rape charges and the like, so really good guy. More recently, Peter Nolan re-emerged to brief notoriety among the global online feminist community for saying this to some feminists in a, a, a lengthy Twitter thread. Peter Nolan is 
such a woman hater that he is disavowed by the men gone their own way and MRA communities as being a misogynist, which is really fucking saying something. Peter Nolan also used to sell kits in the 2000s to help you reclaim your straw man identity from the corporate government. Here's Peter Nolan in court at some time in the 2000s, uh, being really difficult with a judge. And if nothing else, this is a helpful uh, uh, run through of some of the tricks that the average sovereign citizen tries to run through when they're wasting everyone's time in a courtroom. My name is Peter Nolan. My calling is Peter Andrew Nolan. I have told David Dudley that I will enter this courtroom if I have all my inalienable rights intact. No, sir. I will have a seat. When you agree, I have all my inalienable rights intact. I have documents on which I seek to rely, but you have not agreed to the contract that I can enter the courtroom with my inalienable rights intact. Well, if you proceed with the matter on an undefended basis, David, I will charge you one million ounces of gold for enforcing a adjudication process on me that I have not consented to as a sovereign. I stand here before you as a sovereign of the nation of, of the land known as Australia. I have with me documentation to demonstrate that I am the primary creditor of the straw, uh, corporate strawman, Mr. Peter Andrew Nolan, and I have the highest claim. And on and on it goes for hours. It's like these people are doing unpaid PR work for cops and judges. Another early adopter of soft sit tricks was a cool guy called John Wilson, who's been to court over 200 times over not paying fines or taxes because he only pays them when he reckons they're fair. I also only do the dishes or vacuum the living room when I think it is fair. Here's John, sometime in the mid-2000s, arguing with the sheriff because he is being issued a notice to vacate. Presumably he's not paying that bill because he doesn't feel that it's fair. If you've got an issue with the law, yeah. then you go get an expert to run your case for no you. No way, they're, they're crooks. They're, they're a whole it's bunch it's of lawyers it's and judges are crooks. If you're a dental surgeon, you don't go start and breeding cattle, do you? Because you're not an expert in that field. So get an expert in the field. I'd soon find out about it. If I wanted to do it, I'd learn more than the experts. So it will experts. give me no satisfaction or no pleasure to have to evict you from this. Well, you business. shouldn't because if you've got a conscience... Listen, just let me look, I to me, these videos are really striking because they're the average kind of thing that you see people doing all the time online these days. You know, filming themselves being difficult with cops. But these people are trailblazers. They're vexatious litigants and the like who are decades ahead of the curve. And it kind of tells, I think, the story of why soft-sit rhetoric in modern culture has become more popular. It's a soft-sit's dream. They get to film themselves performing and being difficult with people. These are ideal climates for everyone to become modern-day John Wilsons. But try as they might, none of these young pups will ever have the dash of this old warhorse. Once this guy tried to have former Premier Bob Carr declare guilty of treason, he once threw two yellow paint bombs at a Supreme Court judge who dared to find against him, and he's on the rarefied list of people who have been declared vexatious litigant in New South Wales, meaning he cannot bring new court proceedings. I don't care how annoying you are, you'll never be as annoying as John Wilson, mate. In 2006, he tried to citizen's arrest another Supreme Court judge. <laughs> Fuck, they're a cheeky, cheeky bunch, this lot. For a slice of modern soft sit life in Australia, I spoke to Cam Smith, who is a professional coverer of cooker antics on Twitter and one half of the Yeah Nah Passaran podcast with Slack Bastard. I spoke to him about his time documenting soft sit conduct through the lens of the freedom movement. I mean, I've been sort of writing about sovereign citizens off and on over the years. So when I saw them pop up at the start of covid I, I knew what I was looking at. You've had uh, years upon years of looking at the conspiracist world, haven't you? Far long, far before the pandemic hit. Do you miss the days when no one actually knew what the Red Ensign was? Yes, that was a better time. Because, I mean, mm. it, it, this is a movement that's always been bubbling along. But the reason no one knew what it was is because it was a, a small movement. I don't think you can say that anymore. Cam reckons that the evidence of soft seat influence in the Australian anti-lockdown movement was evident from the very get-go with Thanos Panayides and the TV smashing spectacle. Those compilations went out of the, the TV smashing, which is 
was pretty funny, you know, <laughs> television, etc. But this thing here is called a television. Tell a vision. Here's my fucking message. No longer will we be programmed. The thing was, there was an, another boring part of those videos that they all uploaded, which was this sovereign citizen thing where they were opting out of the, the current system. All of those people who smashed their TVs and read out their little script, how many of them knew that they were, you know, reading out a sovereign citizen thing? Because it was sort of a deep cut that a whole de facto government bit. But they were. Hi, Thanos Paniades. That's me. Formally put the de facto Australian federal and state governments on notice. Effective immediately. I rescind and obliterate my vote because it's my vote to all parties within the Australian government, both state and federal. The first way you probably ever saw a sovsit in action, I bet, was from some cooked YouTube video of one of them being really difficult with a cop over a traffic violation. Here's a very famous Oz Sovsit cop car confrontation video. This was a YouTuber called Freeman who since had his channel deleted, but the video is just everywhere online. Do you have your license, sir? Please stop the breath test. Uh, what's the reason why you stop me? I'll just tell you. Well, mate, see, what you are is a subdivision of the New South Wales Treasury Corporation. You've got the Roman wreath on your shoulder, right? You've got two arches on your cross. You've got the Rothschild Red Cross on top of your badge. And you are basically a subdivision. No, I'm still talking, mate. No, no, you can wait. No, you can wait. I'm happy to blow on it. You can still wait, mate. Don't stick your thing in my face. I'm happy to talk. I was talking. You're a foreign army operating on Australian shores. See, the blue and white square here is called Slipco tartan but it's not actually tartan it's actually the roman watermark they're saying we're actually underwater they've converted our roads into lanes the island is between the lanes the shipping lane and these guys are enforcing admiralty maritime law on australian land statutory law do what do what mate i can stick my finger up here anytime i want you're an unlawful entity the constitution says no state may maintain a force I invite you to give me a ticket, mate. We'll go to the Supreme Court. I'm happy for you to give me a ticket, mate. Blow me a kiss. Because you can't do shit. You can't do fucking shit. They're the Rothschild bankers, and they just collect money. And I invite every Australian to give them the fucking finger. Their threats don't fucking work, and they work on loose energy. It's called loose energy. Right? Luciferian fucking fear. Here he is, he's gonna come back. I'll, I'll give him the finger so he can give me another fucking ticket so we can go to the Supreme Court. There we go. He said he'd give me a finger, he's gonna give me a ticket. There you go, there's the finger, mate. Bunch of fucking assholes. Now I asked Cam for a few of his fave sovsit moments from the pandemic. It's a problematic genre, because it's a you know a good sovsit video is always gonna have a sovsit failing in a battle of wits with a police officer. Way back in July 2020, there was a the border stops in Queensland and the, yeah. uh, the guy that uh, tried to just blow through <laughs> the border stuff and they're like, what are you doing? Yeah. But uh, he, try, he tried to put the magic words on me. He's like getting the cop to admit that he's a living man. Okay, so you work for the corporation known as the Queensland Police in all capital letters. Yes. Yes. Not, or, or, not, or whatever. Uh, yeah. So, so not whatever. Am I a man? Well, what do you identify as? No, it's a yes or no question. Am I a man? It's 2020, mate. What do you identify as? Speaking of funny slash frustrating slash funny soft interactions, many people's first taste of soft at the beginning of the pandemic may well have been through Eve Black, who crashed a border check stop. Uh, Victoria New South Wales border at the beginning of the pandemic and notably just like Thanos Panayetis from earlier had some sovsit paperwork in her hands to help guide her through her interactions with the cops and that's pretty important. G'day mate. Good. Um, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks. I think you can hear me today. You can hear me fine. That's fine. Um, reason for travelling. Ah. Have I disturbed the peace today? Hey. Have I disturbed the peace? No. No. I'm just asking what your reason for coming is. Well, I don't need to tell you that. I don't know you. Okay. So where have you come from today? I don't need to answer your questions. No. no. 
Have I committed a crime? Have I committed a crime? Have I committed a crime? Thank you. <laughs> yes! Early pandemic era, you know, they were, of course, not studied sovereign citizens. That takes time. But as is invariably the case with cookers, they are exposed to someone else, obviously, who is. Soft seats love giving you paperwork to ensure that you can get out of, you know, vacuuming your living room or doing the dishes. You might recall me doing videos last year on a hippy-dippy cafe in the Sunshine Coast of Queensland called New Earth Cafe. Well, they were just straight-up hippie COVID denialist cookers, but they were being backed up by a guy called Ricky Sandara, who in turn was linked up with a veteran sovereign citizen figurehead called Zev Freeman, who makes a lot of money from running Sovsit courses now for business owners and the like through the pandemic. So there's a vested monetary or financial interest in it for these people. As I said earlier, if you ever see one of these people holding a bit of paper with this kind of rhetoric, reading it out to the cops, you can bet that there's a meddling Sovsit influencer lurking somewhere in their life, maybe even literally in the background. But alas, Rob Sudi says none of this ever works, ever. I've got around 3,000 different cases on my website. Um, mm. And each, each one of them looking at particular different concepts which have been put forward by the movement. Um, all of them have been rejected and for good reason too, mostly relying on, on precedent that has been set before it um, and which is binding on their court. Um, and if it's not binding, it is, you know, um, it is something that, that would uh, influence the decision of the court. Um, so it's like uh, there hasn't been any cases that I know of in America, Canada, the UK, Australia, New Zealand that have ever succeeded in any of these, these concepts. Except maybe for when they bore the judge. They try to claim that uh, success by... Like, um, for example, walking out of a court and saying, because the magistrate decided to, to adjourn or, or left the room, that's they call that abandoning ship. And then they declare that the case is, you know, settled and they walk out. Um, that's their idea. Because the success. magistrate's gone to lunch or something? Yeah, or, or just because it was a, a vexatious case uh, and, yeah, and, yeah. and the, the defendant was becoming... Know, very obnoxious in that, that he wouldn't waste his time. He'd join for a re recess and come back in um, after the, the security had dealt with that, you know. Um, and often they deal with the case ex parte right there without the defendant in those sorts of situations. Um, even if they're escorted from the court, the case still goes on without them being there. They're just, um, they're just had, they had their chance to have a, a fair hearing and, and they've uh, wasted that opportunity by being obnoxious and not, you know, going by court procedure. Cam recalls one favourite moment of his from a particularly annoying anti-lockdown influencer. So there was a guy called James Bartolo uh, who's gone a bit quiet, but he was a, a big name in the soft space for a while. He did some really annoyingly long videos of getting stopped by the cops. Finally, he got raided by the cops for inciting... Uh, some of the anti-lockdown protests. And the start of this video has the cop saying, look, we've got a search warrant. And his response is just... Excuse me? What, what's the problem? No, you don't. Now, some of these types have a fair dose of the cult-like aspect going around them. And... That type tends to love a good enclave, and sometimes they even love hoarding guns, and that's when they get a little bit more sus and worrisome. Guns drawn, Star Group officers storm a secluded property in Lonsdale. We have no reason and right to be here. You are detained Please. under a general search warrant. Members of a so-called anti-corruption movement question the heavy police presence. They turned up with uh, the big, the big SWAT team, and that's what they allegedly found. Police say a loaded handgun, a rifle with ammunition and drug equipment was discovered at the Liston Road address. He and those at the property say they are members of the Commonwealth Justice Assembly, a group 
group formed to fight against fraud. No, they're pedos. And we've got it all, you f wits. Solange Good's husband, irate, hearing his wife will stay behind bars until January. Let's burn the car! The f and then the next Good supporters stationed outside Elizabeth Magistrate's court all day, waiting for her case to be heard. Listen, I know what you're thinking. Stop being so judgy, right? She probably thinks that the drain is connected to a, a, you know, a pipe or a, a sewage system that might have an outlet inside the cell of Solange. So, you know, she's giving her friend a little supportive cooey and, you know, you'd probably do the same if you're in her position. All right? So stop looking down on these people, you fucking snob. Yesterday, Star Group officers swooped on the couple's farm after they allegedly turned away other officers who'd asked to check guns on the property. Goods posting this recording online in the moments afterwards. We don't want to be at war, but warn your colleagues. If, you know, if they send in the big guns, we will defend ourselves because we're not going to hand ourselves over to people we do not trust that work for pedophiles. That prompted a full-scale response which ended with her being arrested, along with her partner who's been charged but bailed. 13 guns seized from the property, which bears signs proclaiming its sovereign territory, protected by a divine right. We couldn't get through this without mentioning the red flags, the red ends, could we? And this is hardly a way of life. It's just a good way of telling people that you are partial to the ways of the subset cooker. This one has really leaked out among all conspiracists in Australia, so it's kind of quite diffuse in its appeal and meaning now. It's not really the strictly subset thing that it used to be. But its original intention, as associated with subsets, is that it's the original flag of Australia before Australia became a corporation. So therefore, it's the non-corporate one secret hidden true flag of Australia. The flag of why the people, you see. Seven News, fly the red ensign across Australia. Across Australia, the official Australian flag, the original Australian flag, Seven News. Okay, so about the true king of Australia, this might feel a little shoehorned in, but it's not. It's not that much of a stretch. And I do need to mention this true king stuff because of what comes later in part two. Very adjacent to the subset movement is this weird little uh, deposit of cookers who get together in like videos and they chain durries and they wear high vis and they're generally a bit darrow and they talk about who among them is the true king of Australia. I'll get you to introduce yourself. Uh, well, if you don't know who I am, I'm Oliver, son of Michael, son of Cyril of the House of Spencer. Yeah, cool. And um, everybody knows me as Yuha, but I'm Yuha, the son of Jorama of the House of Kiskanen. Um, Anglican Christian, subject of the Kingdom of Australia, loyal to the God of the, of the Kingdom of Australia and the King whoever that may be. If you want to know where King Edward the Seventh's DNA is, Queen Victoria's eldest son, it's right here. Look at my eyebrows. Now, if I shave this all off and I make it like King Edward had it, then, like, I'd even dress like him if I had the clothing. There's one of them called King Steve. He's one of my favourites. King Steve is actually really... He's really bitchy. He's a really snipey, catty, bitchy king. And he tends to call everyone who he thinks doesn't understand him or his kingship or his, his you know, his understanding uh, of the law and the like, retards, which is very, you know, kingly behaviour. And then, yes, I'm rude. I've called lots of you retards. But when you look at the definition of the word retard, it's the opposite of advanced. And you are behind. You are not advancing as a people. You are actually going backwards. So you are retarding yourself. So this lot also tend to talk about stuff like swords of the king and the hidden king and queen of Australia, royal bloodlines, sort of like Darrow Game of Thrones shit. It's a very odd combo of, of different flavours, you know? Now this monarchic obsession 
blended with like m- dumb medieval fantasy shtick is very adjacent to soft set rhetoric and movements and often indeed part of them for a good reason for one please remember all of this because it's crucial to our later discussion about indigenous soft set cookery out at canberra because you know they've got swords and talks about the queen of england and all kinds of shit happening out there more on that in part two. But also, it's worth considering because you'd think that subsets were anti-government and usually they're described as such, given everything I've said. And it seems like they are, sure. But to my mind, there's an important distinction. It's not so much that the subset hates the judge, although they do fucking hate judges, that's for sure. It's often more that they wish that they were the ones swinging the gavel. Personally, I think that the psychology of the soft sit is about being driven by a kind of control complex. Rob Sudi talked about the things that he did over just one traffic ticket when he became a soft sit. I sent, I sent uh, affidavits to everyone I could about a traffic matter. It was only an unlicensed driving matter. And I sent to the, the Privy Council, to the Queen. I sent to the UK Parliament. I sent affidavits to the Holy See, to the Pope's residence. I sent to the uh, the Governor Generals, both and both the state governors and the, the the federal Governor General. I sent to the Prime Minister's office um, and the Parliament. I sent to the New South Wales Parliament and the Premier, to the Attorney Generals of the New South Wales and to the, the federal Attorney General, um, to the to the um, DPP to the local police, to the courthouse, and to that officer that had me, gave me a ticket um, claiming that, that uh, I'm sovereign and, and they have no jurisdiction over me. But no one rebutted all the legal arguments that I'd put together. So, of course, it went into default. So I sent out default notices to each of them saying that we're now in contract and you owe me this much in my fee schedule. You know, like, and it's very empowering. I mean, to, to walk around like you have... Uh, this type of, um, you know, diplomatic immunity in a way. Uh, to, to, you're above the law. You're not like normal people. You've now established a contract with every type of authority figure that exists on the planet, you know. And you have this, your head's, you know, you're 10 foot tall and invincible. They can't touch you. Cam Smith suggests that these tactics really only mirror the power dynamics of big business and finance in the real world. You know, you see these guys when they, they send a notice saying we're going to take over this building and if you don't respond to it within 30 days, we're going to take it over. Yeah. Well, that's what a bank does to them when they repossess their home. You know, they send you a notice and they ignore all of the paperwork they get given and then the bank comes and takes their house. So their thinking is if they can do that, why aren't I allowed to do that? Many self-sits are seemingly embroiled in a lifelong running battle to defend their right to keep their kids or to hurt their kids or to not be penalised for being abusive or violent in the home. I've given this a lot of thought over the past few years because I noticed a lot of like uh, family court dads getting involved and yep. a lot of guys with AVOs and things. And I think that when you've been... For a man, when you're going through that, for a white man especially, going through that family court system, going through that AVO system, like that might be the first time that you've ever been told what to do. And I think yeah. that can drive people into it. You remember the first of those two enclaves we popped in on before? Well, the guy who runs it, Peter Horton, his big beef for the government is over his property, you know, and over his financial obligations and so on and so forth. But his partner, Donna, her big beef with the government is about keeping her kids away from them, or rather, from child protection. Is there any certifiable and verifiable originating cause of action why any of you are here? To investigate. Um, yeah, but no, that's not certified or verified. Well, Do you know what certified or verified means? Under Section yes. 34 of the Children and Young People's Safety yes. Act, any concerns that we believe could be posing a risk to the child? A belief. Is that a belief or a claim? Yeah, that's why we give them a A claim. Uh, actually, that same woman, Donna, uh, recorded her own uh, Sovsit song, which is really amazing because 
I don't even think it like rhymes like as lyrics per se. It's just sort of like a sung thing that a soft would say to a police officer. <laughs> It gets less funny when you realise that in the context of this song, the property she's talking about uh, is her children. Creepy. Softset legend Wayne Glue is the perfect example of someone who's willing to fight till the ends of the earth, even until he loses everything he has to defend his right to not vacuum his living room. This is the great con of the Softset world. You know, their legal games just don't work. This document is evidence that on the 8th of August 2017, I, Wayne Kenneth of the Family Glue, a living, breathing man, a lawfully sworn Commonwealth public official, seized my property at 1004 Chapman Road, Glenfield, Geraldton, Western Australia, under the provisions of Clause 61 of Magna Carta. We put an obstruction across our drive which is a load of rubble that obstruction signifies I have seized my property the council are nothing but an unlawful ABN registered company Wayne Glue despite being a you know, an Australian authority on soft rhetoric still lost his fucking home. That's why people who begin squabbles over petty parking fines often wind up in jail over this shit. The biggest danger of the sovereign citizen ideology is usually to the sovereign citizen, who suddenly become cocky enough to train wreck their entire life on a deluded gamble. In recent years, as with all purportedly anti-government factions of the anti-lockdown freedom movement, the electoral efficacy of pandering to soft has started to become evident to a few fringe cookers who want to be in Parliament. The biggest soft elements in independent politics, I'd say, are the Great Australian Party, founded in 2018 by former One Nation Senator Rod Cullerton. Cullerton lost his Senate seat, but actually reckons he's still an elected senator due to certain naff little procedural requirements that he says weren't met. So this is really fun to me because it's taking all the denialist, conspiracist pedantry of the soft anti-government shtick and actually applying it to the parliamentary process. How fun, I love it. The Gap Party have become tied up in the anti-lockdown movement a big way. Other parties that have dabbled in soft sit rubbish have included One Nation, particularly through Malcolm Roberts, and more recently Australia One and the United Australia Party. It seems the potential political or electoral efficacy of soft sit bullshit is being contemplated or weighed up by more and more parasites as time goes by. So, sovereign citizen rhetoric is about getting out of jail. It's about using conspiracies to exploit and reverse power dynamics. It's about avoiding rates, tax, jail, arrests, charges, court fines, bills, vacuuming the living room, washing the dishes. It's about a power complex. That sense of empowerment, of, of actually of feeling a, a higher status, of, of actually establishing this status which, which makes you untouchable and uh, above you know, any other authority. You're the highest authority that there exists. So you, you then, they use people's own moral sort of code to say that, well, you know, what you say, what you believe to be right and to be wrong is the ultimate law which is it's a pretty empowering thing to actually look at, at life from that perspective, to say, well, it's not really what's written in codes and statutes, it's what, what I believe to be right and wrong, and, and I'm allowed to do this because of these contracts that I have. You know? It's not that they want to get rid of the government, they want to be the government, and they we see with like the, the court systems that they set up, the common law courts, where they have these trials, they want to be the, and you know, they're putting people on trial for treason, where... The punishment mm. is death. They want to be the judge, mm. jury, and executioner. 
stay tuned for part two coming soon in which I'll cover what's been going down near the tent embassy in Canberra, who was behind it and what the difference is between the two sovereignties. Thank you for watching. If you want to support the Aboriginal Tent Embassy ahead of its 50th anniversary, please click the link in the bio. And if you appreciate my work and have a spare claim or two, subscribe to me on Patreon so I can keep it up because it takes a lot of time and effort to put it all together. Again, link in the bio.